Thank you for joining us today. The program is about to begin. Please make your way to your seats and silence your cell phones. Please take your seats. The program will begin momentarily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to dig in on such an important issue of our time right now. Of course, teens and mental health. I know the three of us spend quite a bit of time talking about this in various formats like this. I know with your work and with my work reporting, I'm a correspondent and anchor at NBC News. My name is Savannah Sellers, and I am so lucky to be joined by Lisa Demore, a clinical psychologist as well as an author. <laughs> to make sure we clap for all my panel participants, as well as Lawrence Steinberg. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Temple University, as well as the author of You and Your Adult Child. For Larry. <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining. So we have been talking quite a bit prior to this to kind of understand what it is that we all want to talk about. And we've kind of agreed that what we're hoping we can do today, at least on the surface level anyway, is sort of define the problem, talk about how bad it is or isn't, get into some of the numbers that we're seeing, then also talk about what's causing that, and then hopefully end on kind of this hopeful note about what can be done, um, whether it's in a classroom or within families, at homes, that type of thing. So that's kind of the parameters that we're working in. But I want to start by addressing the fact that we are having a conversation about teens and their mental health, and we are not teens. Uh, and I think it's very important that their voices are genuinely heard in these conversations, that they are actually having that seat at the table to make the difference. So I just want to start by asking you what you're hearing. And I'm happy to share as well what I'm hearing at NBC News, which is um, there was a recent study that came out, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, that talks a lot about different numbers and, and quite a lot of detail, but several of those numbers dealt with suicide. And when I was reading through that report prior to doing an interview with the Secretary of Education and the Surgeon General and a group of students, I almost didn't believe the numbers. Mm -hmm. And when I asked this group of young people their reaction to those numbers, every single one of them raised their hand when I said, have you or a friend mm -hmm. had any suicidal ideation? It was a group of 17s. So they all raised their hands. So for me, that was like, okay, we're seeing this. What is some of the stuff that you guys are actually seeing and hearing? Um, so I care for teenagers. It's a big part of my clinical work. And what I will say is those data, the YRBS data, were collected in the fall of 2021, and they were asking about mood over the previous year. And I think that's a really important asterisk Absolutely. to throw on those data. And they were asking about self-reported mood over a period of two weeks or more. Have you felt really down for a period of two weeks or more? We got a lot of kids saying yes, um, which was not a huge surprise, hugely distressing, but not a huge surprise. What I'm seeing on the ground now is a pretty diverse picture. We have some kids who continue to suffer mightily, either because they were suffering before the pandemic or the pandemic caused suffering. We're also seeing a lot of kids who look like the teenagers I've cared for over 30 years, right? Once the routines came back in place, they got back to business. For a lot of them, they're like, the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. One thing we are seeing that's not being reported is a lot more kids don't go to school. We are seeing absenteeism, truancy, you know, avoidance at rates that are off the charts. And that's an important and interesting story that I think is getting undertold right now. And we'll talk more about that. Larry, what about you? What are you hearing? Um, well, let me add to the, that last observation that Lisa shared, um, because I've heard the same thing. Um, I think that the country was not prepared for how much disruptive returning to school was going to be. Um, a lot of young, you know, there were the young people who really didn't, didn't uh, benefit from being educated um, remotely, but there were a lot of kids who liked it. 
and who kind of got out of practice of, of, of going to school. And so I think part of the policy solution that we'll probably get to is that schools need to be more aware of the fact that coming back to school didn't solve everything. Now, in terms of I'm not a clinician, but on the ground, I teach at a university and I have exposure to a lot of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds, you can't get an appointment at our college counseling center. I mean, it takes months, un unless you are an emergency, in which case you're referred to a hospital, um, you, you cannot get, and I've had students in class who, um, who I thought could use some therapy because of issues that they talked about with me privately, and I've called the counseling center to try to get them in, and it's like three months, it's, it's, it's really incredible. Well, and that's also an under-discussed aspect of the adolescent mental health crisis, that there's two sides. So the one side we're talking about was this huge surge in distress. The side that doesn't get talked about enough is it's a pretty small workforce who cares for teenagers, and it's highly specialized training. And so when we had this huge jump in distress, it's not like we can magically deliver you know, a fourfold increase in the workforce who's trained to care for those young people. So it's the two together, and so as we think forward, you know, we want to think about how do we get more people in the pipeline to do this work? How do we get more clinicians of color in the pipeline to do this work? You know, that there's incredibly interesting policy implications here. And I want to talk more about how to address that when we get a little bit later in the conversation. But something that you said that we've also discussed before that I think is really important for parents to hear is a distinction between a real mental health event that is a problem and should be raising a red flag versus normal development. And this being a difficult age with a lot going on in heads, in hearts, with hormones. How can a parent distinguish the difference in that? This is so important, especially when we're talking about teenagers. And I will say, as the pandemic unfolded, I was so glad that I'd been caring for teenagers for 25 years because I was like, okay, the baseline for adolescent emotionality is high. The baseline for adolescent distress is pretty high. So what are we looking at above that? So the way we want to think about this, and this is true of teenagers, but it's actually true of everybody. Mental health is not about feeling good. It's not about feeling at ease or calm or relaxed. Mental health is about having feelings that make sense in their context and then handling those feelings well. So if your kid's best friend moves away and your kid is deeply upset, that's actually evidence of your kid's mental health. And I think this is a hard moment in the culture because right now the headlines are really equating adolescent distress and adolescent mental health concern, not an accurate equation. So we expect feelings to match the moment, and really where the rubber hits the road is how does the kid handle it? So do they cry? Do they go for a run? Do they want to talk about how they're going to miss their friend? Or do they smoke a ton of weed? Are they a miserable pill to live with? You know, do they take it out on themselves? It's that divide that actually alerts us to whether there's a mental health concern or a typical and expectable reaction to a very hard thing. Larry, I know that you work in this. Yeah, and I, and I think wonderful. that... The, the, a lot of the data that lead to these um, very terrifying numbers come from bad sources. I mean, because the questions, like Lisa referred to here, on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is the main a CDC survey that's administered annually, they don't they can't diagnose depression in and of themselves. I mean, so they ask, um, "Did you feel useless at all during the last two weeks?" Well, you know, maybe you lost your job or something. I mean, we don't know what to make of that. Now, we know that things have gotten worse. I don't, personally, I don't, sorry, personally, I don't think we should get hung up on the numbers. It, to me, it doesn't matter whether it's 43 or 37 or 26 and a half. If any teenager is clinically depressed, we need to help that person. And um, I, I, don't, I don't think it helps to kind of catastrophize it, which is what a lot of the headlines have been doing. Before we move into what you believe could be causing an uptick anyway, no matter the stat on it, let's talk through some nuances of what we're seeing in young people. But with girls, that was a big red flag when the wire BS came out again with that asterisk around it, but what is happening to our girls. But there's also a conversation to be had around boys. And you both have actually enlightened me a lot um, in the nuances and differences in that, st especially when it comes to suicide statistics. Walk us through that. I'll start with you, Lisa. 
Okay, so actually back to what Larry just said. These are self-report surveys asking about a point in time. They're not, they're not our best work in terms of getting good information. And one of the cardinal rules in psychology is that girls internalize when they're distressed and boys externalize. So girls are more likely to have symptoms in line with depression and anxiety collapsing in on themselves. Boys are more likely to act out, to get in trouble, to be unkind to others. The surveys ask about internalizing symptoms. Right. Are you down? Have you felt anxious? And lo and behold, the girls look lousy on these. The surveys do not ask, and I'm not suggesting they should, but they do not ask, have you been a jerk lately? How much are you getting in trouble? Right? Are you looking at hateful content online? I mean, they're not asking the kinds of things that if we were to get good information would give us an early index of distress in boys. And so I'm not convinced that the boys are suffering much less than the girls. I am convinced we're not asking the questions that would surface their distress. Right, and I think that, um, and, and Lisa and I have talked about this, I, th I think that society is in general more sympathetic with people who are internalizing than with people who are externalizing. Because it's harder to feel sympathy for somebody whose mental health problem is, is being reflected in criminal activity or in violence or in aggression or so forth. But since that's the way that boys tend to, uh, tend to express distress relative to girls, I think they, they also are understudied by these big surveys. But I think the reporting is, is probably not where it should be. Um, so you can, you know, do some of that on, on the, <laughs> the crisis for boys, because I think it really needs to get out there to the public. Assignment accepted. Thank okay. you, Larry. Um, and walk me through also the same type of line of questioning, but with suicide rates. What are we seeing there when it comes to gender? Okay. So what we see, it's complicated. It's complicated. But what we see is girls as a group attempt suicide more often Boys as a group complete suicide more often. And again, a lot of times the data that get reported are huge bump in girls coming into the ER, which of course is it's all bad. I'm not like none of this is okay. But again, it lends to this narrative that the, it's the girls who are having this you know, uniquely horrible experience. And when I say more, boys are completing more, I actually pulled up a study to look at it. When you get to ages 15 to 19 in global studies, in terms of, and I hate the term completed suicide, it's very technical for a very you know, horrendous thing, boys are dying by suicide at a rate three times more than girls. And it's not a small margin. But that's because boys and girls use different methods, um, which opens up a whole thing that we don't have time to discuss today about firearms and the easy access that kids have to firearms. Um, and that's why boys complete suicide more often than mm -hmm. girls do. Um, but that, that's a really important policy question that doesn't get discussed a lot when we talk about you know, gun regulation, firearms sales. The, uh, can I say something else about this? Because I don't think people know this. When you see those graphs in the newspaper that show the rates of suicide going up, and they have been, and it's around 14 per 100,000 now in the population, those graphs tend to start around year 2000. If you pull that axis back further into the past, mm -hmm. in 1994, the suicide rate was almost 14 per 100,000. Mm -hmm. So it, it looks like a, a U-shaped function. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's not to trivialize the high rate today, but it is to say that um, some of the things that people are sure cause suicide today in kids, which we'll get to, mm -hmm. were not around in 1994, and a lot of kids were still thinking about or attempting to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. now, when we were talking, oh, go ahead. Well, this is also a delicate point, and I think one worth making, because I think it's really important how we as a society talk about teenagers. Teenagers see the headlines. They are very aware of the discourse around them. And there's a part of me that feels a tension when I see a lot of very alarmed headlines about teenagers. Because I think on the one hand, of course, we want to care for them and be very attentive to their needs. On the other hand, we would never want them to feel like we think they are broken or beyond hope or beyond help. And especially given that if you see a suicide headline, it's almost always going to be about an adolescent. I just want this group to know that the suicide rate is, for teenagers, lower than every older age group. Okay, none of these are okay. I'm not, you know, 
But again, if we really think about where the suicide risk sits most acutely, it's middle-aged men. And, and I say that just as we think about how we want to talk about this, how we want teenagers to hear us talking about this, um, there's got to be, I think, um, a recognition that the data tell a story that is a bit different often than the headlines are transmitting. Context, so important. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, when we were talking prior a couple weeks ago, when you said girls often use drugs and boys use guns, it gave me the chills. And I think that you're right, that that's such an important policy conversation, but also helps us, again, with context, understanding when you just see the headlines about suicidal attempts or ER visits, things like that. Um, the other conversation before we switch to some of the causes and get into social media and all that type of stuff that cannot be ignored is race in this conversation and the right. differences that we see in numbers there. Walk us through that. Well, um, you know, kids of color have higher rates of internalizing problems. I'm not sure whether they have higher suicide rates. That I would. I, I can speak yeah. to that. Yeah. But, but I, I also want to broaden that a little bit to say that the adolescent population is, is very heterogeneous, right? And so you have depressed kids living in poor urban um, areas, and they're depressed because of the poverty and the violence that's around them and the conditions under which they live. And then you have depressed kids living in affluent suburbs, and they're depressed because there's so much pressure on them you know, to get into Harvard or Stanford or whatever. Um, and so even though they might say the same thing about feeling depressed or upset, we need to think about the different reasons that these different subgroups report this, because they would require very different policy solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, let me pick up on that point and then return to the other question. So even on like school absenteeism, right? same story, that we have kids who are not going to school in affluent districts because of incredible anxiety about performance and staying on top of things. And then we have kids in poor urban environments who did not go to school for 18 months in the pandemic because their family did not have Wi-Fi. And like, how do you show up now? Right? So I, again, we've got these truancy questions or absenteeism questions across the board, but they break down very differently. In terms of kids of color and suicide, what we know is in recent reports, there was an alarming jump in kids of color um, in terms of taking their own lives. And in something that does not reflect well on our field, the researchers went to think like, okay, well, what do we know about the precursors of suicide in kids of color? And there were no data. No one had ever broken that question out. So that was fast-tracked through Congress. That data is now coming in. The precursors that are coming in actually tell us more a story about systemic racism than they do about mm -hmm. anything that's unique to these teenagers. Because we get weird findings like, you know, teenagers who died by suicide who are black had a previous suicide attempt. You know, that, okay, that means they didn't get care, right? I mean, we, we're learning these things. So we're catching up to this. And, and I think a real shortcoming in our field is that we've often studied an overwhelmingly white population and then generalized those findings to everybody else. Absolutely. So what's going on? Why is this happening to our teens? Is it the social media of, of it all? Is it harder to grow up now? What do you believe are some of the causes of this? And I know that there are many, and we could have talked for you know four hours in our prep call just about the causes and what is going on. But just to name a few of them, because I think that that context is so important in the same way that we've talked about things that are normal developmentally. What is it that is making things actually difficult, though? I'll start with you, Lisa. OK. Um, I think if I had to sum it up for teenagers, I would say it's harder to be a teenager than it used to be. And I think about it in terms of input and output. They are fielding so much more information than we ever did. And I think it's a lot to integrate. And I think a lot of it does come through by digital technology. You know, that all day long they know what's happening in the news and also what's going on with every person they know. I think that's a lot to take in. And then actually across the socioeconomic spectrum, kids are reporting more achievement pressure. And you know, it's just harder. And, and one of the statistics I love to make sure I cite at every opportunity, you mentioned Harvard and Stanford, in the mid-70s, the admission rate for Stanford was 31%. Right? It was like a sign-up sheet, right? And it is now 4%. Right. When I went to college, I would never get in today. I went to Yale. It was 21% when I was admitted. It is 6%. And so having those numbers at our fingertips, 
I think puts in perspective what the difference is. Yep. Yeah. So I would say um, academic pressure is clearly playing a role. Um, I think economics and finances are playing a role. You know, a lot of teenagers have been growing up in uh, a, a, an uncertain time in terms of the economy and the labor force. They're being constantly told that they will never live life as well as their parents did. Boy, if, they, if you want to depress somebody, tell them that. You know, I mean, and tell them that you know, every, every week for a couple of years, right? Um, and um, can I do my little shtick on social media here yes, for a second? Um, because I'm going to say something that most people in this audience won't believe. Um, but that is that the evidence is inconclusive. Um, when studies find a, a correlation, um, it's small. For those of you who know anything about statistics, it's on the order of 0.15. It's quite small. And when you have two things that are correlated, that doesn't prove that one causes the other. And in this case, there's more evidence that depression leads to social media use than there is that social media use leads to depression. And so the, the effect is, is minuscule, especially compared to other Contributors. Now, I'm not saying it's completely absent, but what I'm saying is the, the headlines are not reflecting um, the, the reality. Um, there is a lot to be depressed about. I mean, to the list that we have already mm -hmm. assembled, there's violence and school shootings and climate change. You know, teenagers worry about those things. They're not just interested in how many likes they get on Instagram. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we kind of do them a disservice by saying, you know, th this, is all, this crisis, which we admit exists, is all because um, they're, you know, they're not friended enough times or um, they, they see what they're missing out on. I mean, that, it's bigger than that, and there's lo lots of reasons for teenagers to feel um, unhappy. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I know that those are the data. I still feel like... Family's experience is it like social media is something like there's a, there's a lot going on here and I think part of what makes it so hard in my clinical work I feel like I don't know a kid for whom social media is not simultaneously a great and a terrible right. experience and sometimes I wonder we yeah. get these low correlations because it's just canceling out right that it's just I don't know if the data can do that but I think they might um, so there's that so what I always try to think about is like okay well, what should we worry about if we're going to worry about social media what should we worry about and for me it's two things one is there is some horrendous content yeah. that is easily accessible on social media. And not just accessible, if your kid like glances in the direction of it, the algorithm will pick it up and then suddenly flood their feed with you know, self-harm, eating disorder, promoting behavior, hate in every stripe, right? I mean, it's kind of staggering. That is a problem. And I think it, you know, kids are influenced by norms. If your whole algorithm is flooded by that, that's a norm that we want to be really mindful of. So there's that. And I know we agree on this one. It can't displace what we know is good for kids. Right. It shouldn't keep them from sleeping. It shouldn't keep them from being physically active, helping others, being with people. So if there's something to worry about with social media, that's what I would have people worry about. And that's something that we can talk through real parameters to yes. get around to help families, which we'll get to shortly. Larry, I want to ask you, though, with you mentioning, you know, it's not just about the likes and friends. What do you think about it, though, just as the feedback loop between harmful content and the things that you just mentioned? Constant news about climate change, constant news about school shootings, uh, and not just being in the palm of the hand of a young person who might not know how to kind of take in that information. I mean, I think that it would make a lot of people feel anxious. And we've been talking about depression, but rates of anxiety have uh, climbed even faster than rates of depression. Um, I think it would make people feel um, kind of hopeless about the future. I mean, they're being told that the earth might not be around, you know, by the time they um, reach their 60s or 70s. You know, I mean, so I think that this constant flooding of bad news. Um, the other thing I want to say, is, and following up on Lisa's point that some kids, you know, kids have good experiences and bad experiences, is that what the research shows is that in terms of social media, the socially rich get richer and the socially poor get poorer. So if you're um, a popular kid with lots of friends and you go on social media, your experience is going to be positive because you're going to be told how pretty you are and how great your outfit is and how much somebody likes you. If you're a kid who is friendless 
and unpopular, and you go on social media, you're going to start to feel, um, I'm you know, missing out on all this stuff that people are doing that's a lot of fun, um, or, or maybe even being bullied or made fun of. So again, I think you know, we need to approach this problem with a scalpel, you know, and not with such a, the sledgehammer that, that's, that's being used now. And Lisa, if you wouldn't mind, just to bring it back to what I had mentioned at the top, telling us a little bit about what you are actually hearing from teenagers about how social media makes them feel, not the headlines. So, I mean, I actually, I quote in my new book, I had this teenager girl, she's like, I love my phone and I hate my phone, right? I mean, they'll, they'll just say it. But also, to give another angle on what Larry just described, in terms of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer socially, there can be the um, sort of superficial reinforcements that kids can give each other. But there's also, like, and I have a 19-year-old daughter and a, and a 12-year-old daughter, and my 19-year-old daughter, so I got to watch her, you know, recent evolution on social media. When college admissions came in, I watched her and her friends create these celebratory videos for one another that were like, I was weeping looking at them. They were so sweet and so kind and so celebratory and so supportive that that's the part where as a parent looking at social media, it's really hard to say this is an all bad thing for all kids because I'm watching beautiful, funny, playful, enjoyable things happen there too. And there is certainly a portion of the population in states where maybe they don't have access to the type of media otherwise if it wasn't social media that makes them feel good about themselves Absolutely. and community that they don't have otherwise. We know there are marginalized kids, especially right. in rural areas, where it is literally a lifeline. And, and that cannot be left out of the conversation. We're going to switch over to talking, hopefully, <laughs> a little bit better news, uh, talk about what can be done here. And I also want you to know that we're going to open up to audience question in just a few minutes. So please start thinking about that if you have any. The first thing that I've heard was the first thing that you said to me when we started talking about solutions or just at least a way to be there um, is what I have heard from kids that I've been speaking with in classrooms and colleges, which is having a trusted adult. Yeah. They don't love that term, <laughs> but they like the idea of, whether it's a parent, but oftentimes it's a teacher, it's a school counselor, it's a therapist. We also, after we talk through that, need to talk about how that's not a one-size-fits-all and that is not necessarily equitable based on each child's situation. But how important is that? And tell us how to be that. Okay, so the thing that lets me sleep at night is the knowledge that we have established really clearly in the literature that the single most powerful force for adolescent mental health is a strong relationship with a caring adult. And so when I look at this adolescent mental health crisis, we are not going to therapize kids out of this, just out of structural reasons, and also it's not necessary for every kid. The solution to this that is most accessible is to improve the relationship between teenagers and the adults in their immediate environment. OK, so what does this look like? One is supporting those adults. Right. The pandemic was brutal for parents. And it is very hard to outfunction your parents. We've also known that for a long time. So shoring up adults, and you're so good on the economic stuff and what those implications are. Then helping adults understand typical development in teenagers, right? And that it is a spicy business on a good day, right? And it always has been. <laughs> and, and I think that one of the trends, and this is just um, observational, it's anecdotal. I feel like in the wake of the pandemic, it rocked us so much. Everybody's like, when are we back on the smooth road? And I want to say, no, look, it was a bumpy road before the pandemic. Then we were in a ditch for two years. Now we're back on the bumpy road with some new bumps in it. There's no easy version of this. And that kind of level setting is so reassuring to adults. And then I think helping adults know how to respond most usefully when teenagers act like teenagers, which is why I love them, but not why everybody loves them. <laughs> Larry, what do you think? Well, so let me, let me begin by talking in general terms about why adolescence as a developmental period is, is such a vulnerable time of life for mental health problems. And so generally speaking, a mental health problem is the product of a, a predisposition um, or an inclination to develop the problem that you already have in you and exposure to stress. And that inclination can be genetic. It can be the, uh, having been exposed to trauma. Um, it, can, it can be um, just having a, a, a bad family life. And, and, and what we know is that if you look at a particular stressor, like let's say um, being broken up with, um, which is stressful for teenagers, the kids that have the inclination 
to develop depression because somebody in their family has a history of depression are much more likely to get depressed by that than the kids that don't have that inclination. So now with that in mind, adolescence is an especially vulnerable period because the brain is still very plastic and very malleable at that age. And in fact, we know that puberty makes the brain more stress responsive. And so to me, we need to, we need to think about two things. What are the causes of stress in kids' lives? And can we do anything about that? Um, and number two, what can we do to help kids learn how to cope with stress, because some of that is going to be inevitable. And Lisa talks a lot about that in her wonderful, wonderful book. But let, let me also say that I encourage schools to do things like teach kids meditation and yoga and to make sure that there's physical um, exercise and physical education during the day to teach them breathing and, and so forth, because those are really good. We can't we can't therapize our way out of this, and we can't de-stress our way out of this completely. And so we need to make sure, and parents can do this too, we need to make sure that kids know how to cope when they're under stress. And that will prevent that stress from leading to a mental health problem. I think both of you mentioned, and I've certainly heard, the academic pressure as one of those major stresses. Yes. What is your message to schools, to teachers, to classrooms? Well, I think that there's not a lot of consensus about where the pressure is coming from. Um, some people have suggested, and I think it sounds like a good suggestion to me, that college admissions committees lim limit the number of AP courses that somebody can list um, on their application and limit the number of extracurricular activities that somebody can list on their application. Um, so you can take as many of the courses and do as many of the activities as you want, but it's not going to help you get in. And that's going to remove some of the pressure that kids feel to be perfect. And when I've gone around and talked to kids in schools and parents, I mean, our, we are driving our kids crazy. We, we are really driving them crazy mm -hmm. by what the pressure that we're putting on them to be and not only perfect, but to appear that you're not even trying that hard to be so perfect. Mm -hmm. What do you think on schools? So on the school thing, I think if we can turn our attention away from like literally like 20 schools, 25 schools that have this wildly selective admissions, the picture gets a lot better. Yeah. There are amazing schools all over this country. I live in Ohio. We are tripping over fabulous colleges that nobody has heard of and or doesn't talk about nearly enough. And so I think as an immediate shift that can be made is if we can get all of the adults who are around teenagers to say, look, if you want to apply to Harvard, knock yourself out and also go buy yourself a lottery ticket. Your odds are roughly the same. And in the meantime, let's look at all the other fantastic schools that would love to have you and that you're going to have a great experience at. If we can take that down and bring into a realistic frame the most you know, kind of competitive, selective schools, I think it instantly gets a lot better because it's not like those are the only schools. It only gets ugly when it's talked about as though those are the only schools. And some schools actively use their health education curricula to teach kids about mental health and managing mm -hmm. mental health. And, and we, if we could get more schools to do that, mm -hmm. um, I think that that would be helpful as well. Absolutely. Let's talk some of those social media parameters, and then I'll open it up to the audience. What should parents be doing? What, sh what should teens kind of maybe strive for themselves if they're stuck in that I love it but I hate it yeah. kind of vibe with their phone with social media? What is it that you think could actually make a difference? Okay, this is a very simple rule. I have parented with this rule, but when I say it, people look at me like I have three heads, okay? Nobody should have a phone in a bedroom where somebody is supposed to be sleeping. Like, ever. Ever, ideally. I know, like, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, we shouldn't as adults, our kids shouldn't. If you make that one rule, that phones do not go in the bedroom when kids are supposed to be sleeping, you get sleep back, Sleep, the data on reduced sleep and the data on increased mental health concerns map onto each other perfectly. Um, you get The kid gets a break. I mean, all sorts of good stuff happens with that one rule. Okay, so you try to make that rule with a the teenager. They'll be like, eh, it's my music player. It's my alarm clock. And then you say, if you're so inclined, here's an Alexa, right? Like, that will do the same thing. But this is a fight worth having. So if you make one rule, that would be my advice. And take it out of your rooms, too, as a way to make the point. And what do you think about that content that's consumed within the app? <sighs> So we need to talk to kids about algorithms. And the best thing about teenagers is that they do not like being manipulated by adults. 
And so if you say to them, listen, the way this works is that they notice what you're interested in and they're going to flood your feed, not because they care about you, because that's how they make money. So you got to watch what's flooding your feed. And the way teenagers talk about it, I love their language, they talk about TikTok having sides. So there's like the sports side and the cat video side and the, you know, great, knock yourself out. There's also the white supremacy side. There's the how to have an eating disorder side. So talk with kids about the sides and help them understand the side you're on, they're making money. And you want to be really, for lack of a better word, kind of cynical about what's being served up. And honest about how easy it is to slip down the rabbit hole of it's all you're served all of a sudden. Absolutely. Uh, Let's open it up to questions. I'd love to, we have a mic that will come around, so please wait until, I see a mic right here, so I'll start with you there in black. Yes. Uh, Please wait for the mic just because we're doing an audio recording as well right now. Go ahead. I was just curious if you have any data on the LGBTQIA plus community and teens. And Sure, there's a lot of data on that. Um, their rates of mental health problems are off the charts compared to um, uh, uh, other kids. Um, and that is partly because of bullying. Um, and, or, and some of it is because of parental non-acceptance of their sexual orientation or sexual identity. Um, and so... Uh, you know, some schools are making strides in this, um, in, in being more open and discussing it and trying to bring the different communities together. But there's no question that that is one of the very vulnerable groups. And also one of those ones where we talk a lot about the benefit that can come from social media yes. for a group. Go ahead if you want to. Well, I mean, teenagers watch the news. So there's what's happening in their peer groups. There's happening what's in their, in their homes. They're also aware of a political landscape that is increasingly hostile to kids who do not fit within conventional sexual and gender identities. And they are very aware of that, and they're frightened. Absolutely. Any tips? Any tips? Um, strong relationships with caring adults, right? That that is always what we can go back to. So for kids who um, are LGBTQ+, right, really making sure that they feel loved by people who are in their immediate environment, that they feel safe, I mean physically safe, and that they feel like they have someone they can talk to if they're worried about themselves. And to not hold back in dealing with your school if your kid is being bullied. Your child's school has an obligation, legal as well as moral, to protect the health and well-being of all of its students. And parents should not be afraid to go to the school and tell them about the specific things that have happened to their child. And um, I, don't, I, th- I think a lot of parents don't think to do that because they don't think the schools, you know, will respond in any way. But I think it's important. Really good advice. Let's come right here. I'll just kind of try to move across the room. Thanks uh, to the woman's earlier comment. I just say I ran a uh, sex health program for 16 schools in this area. And only about 30% of the school districts in America are teaching comprehensive sex ed. And we have to do a better job in out-of-school programming to get that kind of education because that helps with self-regulation, trauma-based practices, social-emotional. It's very holistic. Um, My comment is we have to act like we have our hair on fire and we're looking for water with the advent of where AI is going. You talk about social media. It's going to make social... Uh, what what AI is to social media is like what fentanyl is to pot. So uh, they're going to be manipulating our kids. I just talked to uh, the gentleman who spoke earlier from Google, and he said, well, we got to have hope that our corporations are managing this. And I said, I don't have hope, I have kids. And so he said, in return, we have to make sure and pressure our policymakers in order to make sure that we're regulating. Because one of the biggest things that's going to come out of this is um, is identity theft and how it's going to be used to manipulate children. So I hope you can speak more and more about this in the future. Thank you for this great conversation, both as a parent of a teenager and uh, an educator of teenagers. Um, Larry, you talked about how the problem of social media needs to be handled with a scalpel rather than a hammer. And I'm wondering, you know, are there, are there any data or is there any evidence out there of like actually asking the teens about this problem? Yeah. And, and what are they saying about how to handle it? Well, I don't know what I... Here are the data that I'm familiar with, um, and, and that's about 
and this I think will surprise a lot of people, about three times as many adolescents say that they feel better about themselves after being on social media as say they feel worse about themselves. And so when I, I get nervous when I hear about t you know, taking social media away from kids, which we're not going to be able to do anyway, but that you will be taking away something that's a source of pleasure for millions and millions of teenagers. Um, in, in terms of what kids say, they don't like the unsolicited bad content that they get. Um, and for instance, I've seen studies of, of online pornography, and their first exposure to it is unsolicited. Um, and I don't know whether it's true, you probably know um, about unsolicited information about cutting um, or about um, anorexia in, in a bad way. But are they getting that too? They are, and it um, has to do with intermittent reinforcement schedules. Yes. Which is, okay, so we won't get into that. But, <laughs> which is to say, if you put something in front of somebody that's quite um, alarming, it's actually reinforcing, and that's actually not an intermittent reinforcement schedule, but there's reinforcement schedules. So, which is to say, backing up, all of our social media feeds will occasionally throw in something completely off the wall, distressing, bizarre, to see what we do. And that is happening for kids, that is happening for adults, and there is some human behavior reaction where that actually gets us more engaged. And, and so that's why occasionally in your own feed, you may be like, why am I getting this? It's the algorithm testing. What do you do if we show you this? What do you do if you show this? And it's, it's all very um, diabolical and, and worrisome. And I think really important to talk with teenagers about how that works and why that's happening. Right. Thank you. Um, so the teenage years are long, right? And we're talking seven years and count tweens, eight years, and so I have a tween. My understanding is that an 11, 12-year-old is very different than a 19-year-old, and you have a 12-year-old and you have a 19-year-old. So would love your perspective on the nuance of younger teens versus older teens and how they manage social media, tips that you can give parents for younger versus older. I think your 19-year-old engages very differently with social media and probably has more maturity and an ability to manage the emotions and all things that we talked about than your 12-year-old might, but curious about that. Go ahead. Well, okay, so social media at its best is social. It's where kids have social lives and social connections. And Social connections are wildly important to teenagers, absolutely. Like, a kid cannot function without friends. My advice is use the minimal technology possible to make sure your kid still has good social connections. So depending on where you live, and the coasts are ahead of the Midwest or the middle of the country, there will come a time where plans start to be made by text. And if your kid does not have access to that, they will be left out. That's a problem, that's a problem. In my own home, we have started with a machine, a phone, an iPhone that can only text. No browser, no social media apps, and she can't add them without our permission. And I have said to her, you're riding on texting until you can't maintain your friendships with texting alone. I am gonna stretch this as long as I absolutely can. There will come a time where she says, it's all on Snap. I can't know what's happening, I'm not a part of things, and we'll assess that. But really, it's not social media for its own sake. It's social media for being able to be part of one's social network. And the difference between 11, 12, 13, 14-year-olds using social media and 15, 16, 17, 18, it's huge. So push it as deep into development as you absolutely can would be my guidance. Two observations. One is that to the extent that there is a correlation between social media use and, and mental health um, problems, the vulnerable group is early adolescent girls. No question about it. Um, when I, I teach every year a course on adolescent development, and I've been teaching it as a seminar recently, and when we come to the unit on social media, I ask them if it's a problem for them. Not for any of them. And they will say something like, well, yeah, when I was 12, it was a problem, but it's not a problem for me now. So, the, it, right, like once they're 16 or so, they, 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 know what, they know how to handle it, and their moods are not as easily jolted around by what they see on their screen. Let me just actually say something about age 14, because I think, okay. like, for me, it's a real... Um, 
14, there's a neurological shift in teenagers that's a real watershed, that they develop the capacity for abstraction. They can stand back from things and see it from lots of perspectives. It's a really important time developmentally. And so I think the kids who are having a better experience on social media, they are well past that because they can be like, hey, I'm being played. I don't like this. Whereas no matter how smart your 13-year-old is, they're still pretty concrete and they still take things in whole that they should actually be questioning much more, and they are not quite neurologically there yet. Which is interesting and important to keep in mind since most social media apps say, come on over when you're 13 years old, absolutely. Um, can we go right here, please? I wanted to follow up on the uh, point you raised about these celebration videos that your own daughter um, experience and you found them emotional and, and wonderful. But I wonder in the big picture whether those things are really helpful mm -hmm. because we can't protect our kids and insulate them from disappointment mm -hmm. about not getting into a certain college, but you watch other kids do it. Mm -hmm. And don't we teach our kids, don't rub your friend's mm -hmm. face in. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of kids who are out there celebrating and then there's somebody who's sitting at home mm -hmm. who's saying, I didn't get in mm -hmm. and that hurts. And you see it. And again, you know, the bumps in the road, you got to deal with them. But I just wonder whether those sorts of things are good and ultimately whether colleges have a role in all this, you know, which is if you post, we reserve the right to retract your acceptance. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we help these kids monitor what they post and whether it ultimately is helpful or hurtful? I think it's an important question. I will say part of what made me more at ease with what I was seeing. We live in the Midwest, where I'm happy to say the college stuff is, pre is quite a bit more toned down than it is in other parts of the country. So the schools that are being celebrated are wonderful and also highly accessible schools for a lot of kids. So I think if it had taken on another tenor, I think I would have felt differently about it. But it was really quite, to me, it felt very wholesome and kind. That said, it is so painful for kids to be sitting at home on a Saturday night and know what everybody else is doing that they're not doing. And I don't think any of us wish we, as adolescents, had that information. And I think all of us are so grateful that we had no idea how out of the loop we were as teenagers. And I say that to say it's actually a really nice way to talk with kids about this reality, is to say, you know what? I wasn't invited as a teenager either. I just didn't have to know. And for a lot of teenagers, they're like, thank you for saying that. So there's a half step between ending it or trying to block this exposure to this information, which is just to empathize with, that's a lot of information to have. And I didn't have to have it as a kid, and I'm sorry you do. Teenagers really appreciate empathy, and that can often get them right back on track. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of neurodiversity um, and mental health, ADD. And dyslexia, those kinds of issues that show up a lot in school and performance in school, even before we get to like, yeah, you know, applying to highly selected colleges. I don't know anything. Okay, so neurodiversity is a big tent, right? There's a lot of ways to be neurodiverse. So the big tent thing I can say is that school, almost all schools, by its nature, rewards a very narrow band of skills, and if you won the lottery and are strong in those skills, lucky you, because you're there eight hours a day for 18 years at least. If you are one of the many, many kids who just, your gifts are not in that band, school feels awful. And, and I don't think we celebrate enough the kids who still stick with it every single day, show up, are good citizens, when their experience of school is like overwhelmingly demoralizing most of the time because their strengths are not in this very narrow band. So the way I think about it is, how do we make sure that every kid, every day, feels good about the gifts they have? And if you're lucky, that happens during the school day, or you go to a school that can do that for you, or you have a support around you that makes sure it happens if that's not what can happen in your school day. for just one second. Perfect. Hi, uh, I am a school leader on the west side of Chicago uh, where my students don't necessarily worry about school shootings but actually worry about community shootings. 
Um, about 90% of my kids have been directly impacted by gun violence. Um, I have seen an uptick in apathy and anger and depression in our community. And I'm just wondering, it feels like in education we talk out of both sides of our mouths. We talk about social-emotional wellness and the importance of that, and then we go, NAEP scores are down! Like uh, When we know that depression and trauma impacts the brain and really impairs learning. And I don't know if everybody, like everybody should know that. Impairs memory and tension, the ability to process information and decision-making skills. And I would love to know from you what type of education reform, not at the college level, but even down into the primary level, we need to be making to ensure that our kids are not only achieving academically, but are socially and emotionally well. Well, there are um, a lot of very good social-emotional learning curricula, which um, many school districts are using. Um, there's actually a repository of them that's online. You can download them for free. What we do know is, is that if your school is going to use that, you can't sort of silo it as a separate subject matter. It has to be incorporated into the whole school curriculum. And there's a lot of very good evidence that um, that kids' mental health improves when, when SEL, social emotional learning curricula, are in their schools. But I'm glad that you raised the point about the... Well, you know, states have standards and that schools have to comply with. It wouldn't be, um, you know, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Illinois could require all of its public schools to have SEL curricula. And there, for all I know, there may be some districts or states that do require that. Um, so we know, it's, we know it works. The, 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 the trouble is convincing schools that, you know, that doing this is going to take time away from the really important things, you know, um, like the academic subjects. I do want to thank you for raising the issue of the community context because I, 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 I think we, we sometimes forget that schools exist within a context and the teachers and other professionals who work in the school need to understand the context in which their students are living because that's going to affect how they behave in the classroom. I'm not a policy person. But I do worry tremendously about the way in which being a teacher is becoming an increasingly undesirable profession. And I do think there are probably policy implications for making teaching vastly more desirable. And I think at the individual level of relationships, and I think about the fact that if we make teaching very undesirable, schools will be staffed by warm bodies as opposed to people who love kids, get kids, are interested in kids. And when I think about the connection with learning, and it's, I agree with you entirely, I always think about, okay, how does learning happen? First, it's the three C's for me. First, there's a connection between the child and the adult. That connection helps a kid calm down, especially kids like the ones you are caring for. Only when that kid is calm can they take in content. And so for me, we have to start with who is the adult in the room and do they want to be there and do they feel supported by our entire society for this critical role they play. Thank you both so much. Thank you as an audience. These are some of the best questions I've heard. I've been here all week, so I really appreciate you engaging in this discussion. You both are fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank Great you. job. Thank you. Thank you.